For 2024, Chevy has made some pretty massive changes to their popular Traverse SUV. It gets more power, it gets a nicer interior, much bigger LCDs, and that's why when I first saw this, I assumed it would get a lot more expensive. But in fact, it's thousands of dollars less than its new competitor in the US, the Toyota Grand Highlander. And just on value alone, I suspect the Traverse might be in line for our SUV of the year at the end of the year. But stay tuned for that. While we wait, let's dive into this Z71 model first, talk about what's new on the Traverse and why you might want to cross shop this against, well, pretty much anything with three rows in America. As usual, I'll take a deep dive into pricing at the end of the video, but starting things off, you need to know the base price, $38,995 including destination. The reason you need to know that is because it is significantly less than a Grand Highlander. It's about $5,000 less expensive, $1,000 less than a Grand Cherokee L, and actually very competitive against some significantly smaller three-row SUVs in North America. Now, this Z71 trim is the off-road trim, so of course it's not the least expensive model. This one started at $47,995, and as equipped, it's a little over $50,000 but it's still a pretty decent deal because base Z71 versus base Honda Pilot Trail Sport, this is actually gonna be about $1,000 less expensive while having, I think, a nicer interior than that Pilot Trail Sport. And depending on what you're looking for, perhaps a little bit of extra capability, but the two vehicles are definitely targeting the same demographic. As far as front end design goes, obviously this is the Z71, so we find that badging there. We find a grille that is pretty similar to one in the RS. If you get the LS or the LT trim, we get more of a horizontal grille, but the bulk of the front end is very similar. All models will have full LED headlights and LED turn signals. The Z71 brings us these red tow hooks and functional underbody skid protection. This model also has well-integrated front parking sensors, but there is a little bit too much shiny black plastic for me, especially if you want to go a little bit further off-road. As we've seen in a few other recent Chevy products, the DRL and the turn signal are up here, and the full LED headlight, that's down there. Is the Traverse a midsize or is it a full-size three-row SUV? I'll let you all decide down there in the comment section. I would lean towards calling it a full-size because it's 204 and a half inches long. So it's about five inches longer than a Honda Pilot, an inch and a half longer than the uh, new Grand Highlander, and just a little bit shorter than the Grand Cherokee L. Interestingly, it's also a hair shorter than the outgoing 2023 Traverse but that mainly has to do with the front and rear overhangs. They wanted to tighten the dimensions up because they knew the Z71 model was coming, so we have slightly shorter bumper overhangs in the front and in the rear. We have the exact same wheelbase, and most of the interior dimensions are pretty similar. One thing that isn't similar, however, is the ground clearance. That did surprise me. The Z71 is gonna be the highest model off the ground. We get eight inches of clearance here. If you get the rest of the Traverse lineup, we get a little under seven inches of clearance. I have to admit that surprised me a little bit, especially since we have the Z71 model in the lineup now, which is ostensibly the more off-road capable Traverse. In addition to the red tow hooks that you can see peeking out from the front bumper and the increased ride height, the Z71 also gets a tweaked suspension tune and unique 18-inch wheels. These are wrapped in all-terrain tires, and they're 265-65R18, so we have significantly more cushion on these tires than you find in the RS with those big 22-inch wheels. Chevy opted for a modern and clean aesthetic out back, and by the looks of it, easy to clean as well. We have lots of really smooth shapes here, and the tail lights don't stick out a lot from the body, so there aren't too many nooks and crannies to clean when you're washing your car. The tail lights, they're full LEDs with this sort of forked appearance here. The backup lights, those are down here at the bottom of the bumper. Also at the bottom of the bumper, we find quad exhaust tips, which is kind of adventurous since this is a turbocharged four-cylinder engine-powered vehicle. In the center of everything, we find the hitch cover. This is rated to tow up to 5,000 pounds when properly equipped. And then we have backup sensors back here that are standard in every trim. In fact, there's quite a lot of standard safety equipment going on here. To be honest, in the past, Chevy has lagged the competition when it came to integrating active driver assistance and active safety tech in base models. But that's not the case for 2024. And this now includes more active safety tech than we find honestly in all the competition's base models and even a lot of the top end trims of the competition. It's such a long laundry list. I'm just gonna run through the highlights here real quick. We have autonomous emergency forward braking with pedestrian, cyclist, and junction assist, adaptive cruise control, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic detection, rear parking sensors, reverse autonomous emergency braking, and a 360-degree camera system standard on even the base trim. 
Key thing to know is that we get a lot of active safety tech on the average Honda and Toyota, but we don't get features like blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic detection standard typically on those models. There are some exceptions. We don't generally find reverse autonomous emergency braking in everything out there. And this is the only thing I can think of that has a 360 degree camera system standard. Of course, if you want to take things to the next level, then you definitely want to check the option box for Super Cruise. That's basically Cadillac's hands-free driving system democratized now to the Chevy lineup. It is kind of a pricey option. We'll talk about that later. But if you're shopping for any trim other than the base model, I honestly would be pretty tempted to check that option box. A new SUV wouldn't be complete without a new engine, so of course we find one under this hood, and it's quite a different engine from what we found in last year's Traverse. It's not a V6 anymore. Instead, it's a brand new 2.5 liter four-cylinder turbo. It produces a reasonable amount more horsepower than the outgoing engine, 328, and a whole lot more torque. 326 pound-feet at significantly lower RPMs. This engine is related to the 2.7 liter truck engine that we find in the Silverado and the Sierra, etc., but it has been redesigned and re-engineered for transverse engine applications like the Traverse, the upcoming Buick, and of course probably a Cadillac tossed in there somewhere too. One of the most important changes is that under this cover we have an air to water intercooler and that means that we have a much shorter plumbing route and actually we find less turbo lag in this engine than we find in the 2.7 liter truck engine. I will tell you, it's also significantly smoother than 2.4 liter that we find in the Grand Highlander. It's mated to an eight-speed automatic transmission, sending power to your choice of the front wheels or all four wheels. But there are two different all-wheel drive systems. If you get the Z71, then we have a different rear differential. It's a torque vectoring unit with a twin clutch design. It can function as either a torque vectoring rear axle or a limited slip axle, which is the reason that we have it here in the Z71. Front seat comfort is going to depend on the trim you're looking at, of course, because the base model is not going to get the power front seat design that we find in this trim. Nice touch is that we have four-way adjustable lumbar support in this power adjustable seat, which is something that we don't find in a reasonable number of the competition. I find these seats to be generally supportive for my body shape. I find the seat bottom cushion nice and long. Some of the competition definitely has a shorter seat cushion, and the seats are a little bit wider than average as well. But I do think that the Grand Cherokee L has more comfortable front seats at least available. Over here we have a manual tilt telescopic steering column and we find very similar front seat designs in the top end version, the RS trim, but in this model, the Z71, we don't have a power front passenger seat. One of the big reasons to buy the Traverse is, well, it's big in here. We get almost 118 inches of combined legroom. That's front row plus second row plus third row. And this is a very child seat friendly interior as we're going to talk about in a bit as well. This is a little bit less legroom than we find in the new Toyota Grand Highlander, but significantly more than we find in the Grand Cherokee L, because that Grand Cherokee L has that really long hood profile up front. Now you can get the Traverse as either an eight passenger or a seven passenger vehicle. So the back seats that we're gonna look at in a moment, there are always gonna be three of them back there, but the second row, you can get either a bench seat or you can get these captain's chairs. The captain's chairs have a trick up their sleeves, something that we see in a lot of GM vehicles and actually Stellantis vehicles as well, the ability to leave a child seat latch anchored into place and still easily access the third row. For vehicles that are really focused on family hauling, I am constantly surprised that this is not a standard feature in every three row SUV in America. This is something you won't find in the Pilot or the Grand Highlander. Thanks to the articulating second row seat design, getting in the way back is easy even if you don't have child seats in place, just due to the way those seats actually move. Now, hopping back here into the third row, you'll notice that, again, seat bottom cushion, a little bit lower to the ground than some of those full size SUVs, but pretty similar to the Grand Highlander but we get more headroom than the Grand Highlander. So depending on exactly who you're trying to stuff in the vehicle, this is actually gonna be roomier than that new supersized Toyota. And actually, I find these third row seats a little bit more comfortable than the ones in the Grand Highlander. Of course, a lot of folks are gonna keep the third row folded most of the time, so we have lots of hard plastics back here to help improve cargo durability. If you have bags and things like that rolling around back here, you don't want soft touch plastics because they're just gonna tear easily. But we do have USB-C charge ports on each side and some pretty big cup holders that we'll look at in a moment. If you like the wind blowing through your hair, you're going to love the positioning of the air vents in the third row here. They're on the ceiling, so even the center passenger in the third row can get a little bit of air as long as everybody agrees, of course. Moving over to the sides, those are the USB-C ports that I mentioned earlier, and that's what the cup holder looks like back here. We get a little storage pocket and then the cup holder up front. 
cargo capacity is a big advantage for the Traverse, not just compared against similarly priced entries that are smaller than this, like a regular Highlander, but also the biggest entries in this segment. We have about 10 or 15% more cargo capacity back here than we find in that Grand Highlander. And that means that a 22 inch roller bag can actually be in that position and you can still close the power hatch. In a smaller number of the competition, you can line up bags like this across the back, but honestly, in most three row vehicles in this category, you'd have to have them in this position, which is really limiting the amount of cargo you can carry. And for even more cargo carrying capability, we have a big underfloor storage well where you could almost put a 22 inch roller bag and just close that. I'm surprised that Chevy didn't try and squeak out maybe an extra inch of space so you could actually put even larger items right down there. Now, don't worry, Chevy did not forget the spare tire. After undoing a whole bunch of knobs, you will find it under this entire floor section. I'll go ahead and fold those third row seats so you can see that. That lifts out, and then under there, we have the temporary spare tire and the Bose subwoofer. The first interior we're gonna look at is the Z71 interior. I apologize for this being so dark. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to film all dark interiors. We have sliding sun visors, so those slide side to side rather than an extension that comes out. We also have this big panoramic moonroof in this particular model. As you can see, air vents there on the side for the second row passengers, and then air vents in the ceiling again for those third row passengers. We get height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, two-way adjustable headrests with the Z71 logo embroidered on there. And because we're in the Z71 trim, we also get red accents. Here's a better look at the front seat design. As you can see, the seat bolstering is not terribly aggressive, so larger drivers and passengers shouldn't have any trouble getting comfortable here. And you can see that not only do we have the red stitching, we also have some white accent stitching to help dress things up and give it a little bit of extra color pop. Speaking of color popping, we have really bright accents on the doors and on the dashboard. It's a little bit difficult to show you in this particular lighting, but we'll see what we can do here. You can see it fades to a more red, from a more black texture there. It actually is just part of the cross-hatched texture in black that you get that particular look. Decent number of soft touch materials in the upper section of the door, injection molded plastics there. We get red accent stitching on that soft touch armrest, and of course harder plastics down there at the bottom of the door. Moving over to the dashboard, depending on how strong the light is, the dashboard can look either basically black or it could look sort of a medium red color. Again, Soft touch materials in the upper section of the dashboard. This has been after stitched to give it the impression of a stitched piece of material. It's actually just an injection molded dashboard. If you want more premium materials and more of a luxury car vibe, that's what the new Buick Enclave is for. And I'm definitely happy that GM is differentiating their products a little bit more than we found in previous generations. Down here, we find a reasonably sized bin style glove compartment. You'd have no problem fitting an 11 inch tablet computer inside. In the middle of the dashboard, we find an absolutely enormous touchscreen LCD infotainment system. This is standard in every trim, and it's over 17 inches. It extends to just over here from the volume knob. You can see we actually get animations right there because the volume knob is hovering on the screen itself to all the way over here in this corner where we find a little bit of a chamfered edge. Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, yes, smartphone integration is standard and it is supported. Happens right here in the middle of the screen, but you'll notice that the smartphone is actually controlling the background on this as well, and that helps it integrate a little bit better with that curved display. In the upper left corner of the screen, we find some direct access buttons that will take us to, for instance, the home menu in the system. You can also get a direct access button to the factory Google connected navigation system. That's a really nice touch that we find there. Obviously direct access back to Apple CarPlay and some vehicle safety settings as well. Then we find climate controls down there at the bottom, but those are not the only climate controls we have. They have also given us some physical controls for that system. So if you don't want to use the touch screen, you don't have to, you can use the physical knobs and buttons down here. Moving down further from that, we find the optional Qi wireless charging mat. It is not standard in every trim. We then find two really big cup holders here, a storage area, a reasonable amount of shiny black plastic. That's the one thing I'm not the biggest fan of in here. But then we have a pretty decently sized storage area in the center. This is definitely more storage room than you'd find in a Grand Cherokee L because there isn't a two-speed transfer case and a transmission under there. So we get a lot more room in something like this. 
Over on the driver's side, we have what looks like a head-up display bump, but it's actually just part of the driver warning system. So we have an LED array there. It will flash some lights up that will reflect on the windshield to let you know something's going wrong. Moving out from there, you'll notice that this large twin LCD system that is standard is not behind what kind of looks like one pane of glass like we find in the Buick and some Cadillac models. Instead, it's two different screens at sort of different levels. So this instrument cluster over here is just over 11 inches and it's just a little bit in front of that larger 17 inch display. What's really interesting about this is not only do we have Apple CarPlay, we have two screen Apple CarPlay. So this map and those directions right there, those are being driven by the iPhone that is connected. Of course, there are a bunch of different display layouts that you can cycle through. I've always liked General Motors full LCD instrument cluster software. The graphics are really nicely done and I like the functionality that it brings to the table. Of course, if you want to use the factory navigation, you can get that moving map display there as well. Moving out from there, we have the pretty typical Chevy steering wheel. This is one of the latest designs that we've seen from them. Z71 badging down there. Of course, the Super Cruise display right here on the top of the steering wheel. This is going to light up in different colors to tell you what the system is doing. And it also has the driver monitoring system integrated into this wheel as well. That's one of the things I really love about Super Cruise is that we don't have those blue cruise like bumps on the side of the vehicle. It's all really nicely integrated into the steering wheel. And because this is really in your line of sight as you're driving along, it's really obvious what the system is up to. Now down here, we have some buttons for the infotainment system and that multifunction LCD cluster. That's how you control it over there. And then on this side, we have the controls for the standard adaptive cruise control system. In case you're wondering, we do have the same sort of column shifter that we first saw in the Cadillac Lyric. On the back of the steering wheel, there are shift paddles. Unfortunately, Chevy did not bring along an LS or an LT trim for us to check out, but we have been able to spend a day in this RS model. Let's take a look at the differences. We have these massive blacked out 22 inch wheels wrapped in 275R22 tires. There's more blacked out trim up front than you'll find in the Z71 and the rest of the lineup. Obviously RS badging there and no tow hooks below, but the look is kind of similar to the Z71. No horizontal stripes like we find in the base model. We have progressive LED turn signals up front. That's a nice touch. They flash on and then they fade out towards the side. The headlights, they're still lower down on the bumper. As you'd expect in an RS trim, we get lots of blacked out accents around, blacked out wheel arches, blacked out sills, etc. The tail lights are essentially the same as the rest of the Traverse lineup and all models are going to get the same quad exhaust tips. The RS trim also gets a few extra doodads inside. We have power folding third row seats, a power passenger seat that has the same range of motion as the driver's seat, including that four-way adjustable lumbar support. And this is the model to get if you want heated and ventilated leather seats up front. You'll find imitation leather in the Z71. The second row seats become heated and there's also an electronic release for that same tilt slide mechanism we saw in the other model. So instead of the lever, there's a button right down there. On the driver's side, things look pretty similar, but we get a flat bottom steering wheel in the RS trim. It's also powered and memory linked. You'll find a manual adjustable steering column in the other trims. Before we get the Z71 or the RS out on the road, let's get this out on a trail. Now, this is obviously not the most complicated off-road trail ever designed. This is actually mostly uh, about two miles of grass, apparently, where they're saying we can go up to about 45 miles an hour. So let's give this a whirl. Uh, and in this situation, you'll really notice the new dampers that we have in this. The Z71 has a differently tuned suspension than the rest of the lineup. Not only do we get the smaller diameter wheels, 18 inch wheels instead of 22s, so we get extra cushioning. We also get all-terrain tires. And all-terrain tires this size and this profile definitely soak up more of the bumps on the road. So a really good thing if you plan on going a little bit further off the beaten path, something like that. In some ways, you can think of this as the same formula that Subaru uses so successfully in their vehicles, just in a much, much bigger package for the same reason. This is definitely very comfortable out on trails like this. Z71 and the RS both use dual mode dampers, but the damper design is tuned differently between the RS and the Z71, of course. The RS is more sporty, and this is a little bit more off-roady, but the dual mode dampers perform very much the same function. One valve handles bigger imperfections on the road. Think speed bumps or big potholes or some of these big chugs in the road like the gopher holes here and there. Whereas the other valve handles the more minor imperfections in the road. So think freeway expansion joints, pebbles on the road, that sort of thing. 
that allows the suspension to not only give you better handling performance, but also soak up some of the larger bumps without disturbing the handling characteristics of the vehicle. I've now hopped into the new RS trim to talk about how the Traverse drives on the road. Now, obviously, this is going to be the best handling Traverse, but all Traverses are going to have very similar 0 to 60 times. Our best run out here in Georgia was about 7.8 seconds in front wheel drive mode. Remember that we're around 1,000 feet and we're not at home, so obviously take those numbers as they're intended as just sort of general reference. We'll have official 0 to 60 times by the time we can get this at home for full testing. I think it may be just a hair faster at home. We don't really know. The other thing, though, to keep in mind is that we are driving pre-production vehicles, so there could be some changes between the model that we're driving here and the full production traverses that may affect 0 to 60 times. However, the 60 to 0 stopping distance was quite impressive with this model. Keep in mind, this one has the widest tires, 275 width tires, 22 inch wheels. These are absolutely huge wheels, but they also have a really big contact patch on the road. And that's how this stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in under 118 feet, just under. That is a truly impressive stopping distance, considering the fact that this weighs nearly 4,800 pounds. The next thing we should talk about is the two and a half liter turbo engine. We'll just go ahead and stop here and then accelerate so you can hear. We do get a little bit of wheel spin there, depending on the surface. And clearly you're going to get some four cylinder sounds in the cabin. But the first thing that I noticed is that this engine is not as gruff as the 2.4 liter turbo from Toyota and not as gruff as the related 2.7 liter turbo in the truck lineup at Chevy. So if you were concerned that this would sound a little bit too truck like, it actually sounds a lot smoother. Now, on the other hand, I do think that the old Traverse sounded better. That V6 has a really nice sound in the previous generation Traverse, and this is certainly going to sound more like the average compact car than formerly what you would associate with a three-row vehicle like this. On the other hand, this is definitely the direction everybody is going. It's not just Chevy. It's not just Toyota. I would really expect to see pretty much every mainline entry in the three-row SUV segment move to a smaller displacement turbo over time. That shouldn't be too much of a surprise, of course, because, for instance, Ford has long had a 2.3-liter turbo in the Explorer. I think that engine has done pretty well for them. This engine has slightly better output numbers than that Ford 2.3 liter turbo, but in terms of 0 to 60 times, I think the Explorer might be just a little bit faster. One thing that I did notice is that if we come to a complete stop here again and floor it, you know, we get a reasonable amount of oomph there at the beginning, but then obviously the traction control system has to intervene and engine output is reduced. If I engage all wheel drive mode and then do the exact same thing here, then we get sometimes what feels like a slightly delayed start. First gear is not as low as, say, the new Honda Pilot with that 10-speed automatic transmission. That has a very, very aggressive starting ratio, and that's really why the Pilot is so quick 0 to 60. When it comes to handling ability and general vehicle dynamics, I think they've done an excellent job with the Traverse. This is definitely a refinement over the previous generation, and we have nice wide tires, especially on the RS trim. This model has 275 width tires, again, those 22-inch wheels and low-profile tires, but all Traverses actually have pretty wide tires all the way around, and you'll really notice it out on the road. Driving this aggressively on these winding roads here in Georgia, you really have to push this a lot harder than you'd think to get the tires to squeal. And this drives an awful lot smaller than you might think. Bearing in mind that I'm not driving this back to back with the competition today, I would say that I prefer the feel of this versus the Grand Highlander, although I really do like the way the Pilot drives out on the road. But this, I think, is a really good competitor to that Honda Pilot when it comes to driving dynamics, even though this is pretty big. Also keep in mind though, the Pilot has grown quite a bit in this last generation, and it's not as dynamic as previous versions were. Since I'm not driving this at home, I don't have any official cabin noise scores for you, but we do have active noise cancellation standard on the Traverse. That's definitely a nice touch, and the cabin does come across as pretty hushed. Bottom line, at least for the moment, I think Chevy did exactly the right things with the Traverse. I know some folks are going to be upset about the 2.5 liter turbo. It doesn't sound as good as the old 3.6 liter V6, that's pretty obvious of course but we do get improved fuel economy. We also get massive amounts of torque. And the reality is that in most driving situations like cruising down the highway here, this is simply going to be quieter than the old 3.6 liter V6. And you're really not gonna hear much engine noise at all because we get so much extra torque, the transmission doesn't have to downshift to go up small inclines like this. And then of course we get Super Cruise. We're driving hands-free right now, and this is quite simply the best hands-free driving system available in North America today. It is so much smoother than Blue Cruise or the new one that we find in the Ram and Jeep lineup. 
I'm actually surprised that GM has not tried to, I don't know, license this to some other car companies out there. But keep in mind that Super Cruise is on the expensive side. There's a reason. It is really smooth, it's really good, it's very accurate at lane positioning. It has a lot of sensors around the vehicle to try and be safer than some of those other camera-based systems, but all of that adds improved cost. And one of the things I really like about Super Cruise is that it's really good at driver notifying. Uh, if you want to know more about Super Cruise, you can check out some of our full videos on Super Cruise. But just in a nutshell, we have this green LED right here at the top of the steering wheel. So that's how you know that the Super Cruise system is doing its thing. It will change colors based on the various drive modes. The driver's seat also vibrates when you need to take over with the system. And that's a lot better than the systems that just change the color on the LCD cluster there. Now, occasionally it does some funny things like right there. It kind of veered into the oncoming lane a bit. It just barely hit one of those bots dots, but it didn't cancel. It it resumed its operation. As we roll through the pricing, it's important to remember that the average Chevy, generally speaking, transacts below MSRP and further below MSRP than the average Honda or Toyota. So when you look at those prices on the side of your screen and you think to yourself, that Traverse is a pretty good deal, keep in mind the deal's probably going to be even better than that, especially after the Traverse has been on sale for about a year or so. The base price, it's still pretty reasonable. $38,995, including destination, puts this significantly less than a Grand Highlander, notably less than a Grand Cherokee L, and actually pretty close to something like a regular Highlander, which is significantly smaller than the Traverse. And we get a lot of standard feature content, all those active safety systems that I mentioned earlier, and of course the absolutely enormous LCDs on the inside. That 17.7 inch screen and the 11 inch instrument cluster those are both standard on every trim. As far as I know, this is the most standard screen real estate you can get in this segment. That model is also going to have active noise cancellation. You can add all wheel drive to the base model for $2,000. That's a little bit less expensive than some companies charge for the all wheel drive upgrade. And it's going to have eight seats on the inside. If you want a model with eight seats, you're going to have to look at that or the next trim level up, which is the LT at $41,395. That gives you the option of seven passenger or eight passenger seating. It's also going to have a power driver's seat, but it's not going to have a power front passenger seat. That trim's also going to give you the wireless charging pad in the dashboard for your smartphone, an integrated 120 volt inverter, and the option for Super Cruise. Super Cruise is also an option on this Z71. This started at $47,795. Most of the upgrades over the LT trim have to do with the off-road capabilities. So the tweaked suspension system that is somewhat related to what we find in the RS with the dual mode dampers. We don't find the dual mode dampers in the other two trims, but you'll get it in Z71 and RS. They get the unique wheels, tires, the extra underbody protection, and the all-wheel drive system upgrade in the rear. You can also get image imitation leather on the inside, which is what this Z71 you've been seeing today has on it. And then the Super Cruise option is just under $3,800. Remember that Super Cruise is not just a new steering wheel and some extra software. They put a ton of extra sensors on the vehicle, extra radar modules, etc., and it uses all of those various sensor inputs, including the cameras, to help guide the vehicle down the road, which is why Super Cruise is currently my favorite hands-off-the-wheel steering system. This is not self-driving in the way that some people might think. It's not a robo-taxi or anything like that, but it is one of the very few actual hands off the steering wheel systems that will just take you miles and miles and hours down the road with your eyes on the road, hands off the steering wheel. Super Cruise is significantly more refined than Blue Cruise that we find in the Ford and Lincoln lineup and more refined than the hands-free driving system that we now finally see in the Jeep lineup. Those software packages, they haven't been around as long, they haven't had as much refinement. Super Cruise has had a lot more time in the oven. If you want a fully loaded Traverse, that's going to be the RS trim. It's $55,595, and it's also ostensibly the sporty version. It gets a front end design that is somewhat similar to the Z71, of course, without the tow hooks there, and it basically comes one way, fully loaded. You do have the choice of all wheel drive or not, and that could bump the price up to $58,600 with the optional paint job, and that's basically the only option on that model. It has everything you could imagine in a Traverse, except that it's not a high country or a premier. Because interesting twist in this generation, it seems like Chevy is leaving perhaps a little bit more room for GMC and Buick in this segment. Remember that we're getting a new GMC Acadia that is exactly the same size as this, and we're getting a new Buick Enclave, which is also about the same size as this. 
all three vehicles share the same engine, they share the same transmission, they share basically the same all-wheel drive system and very similar interior dimensions as well. Why would you want the one over the other? Well, there's got going to be a corollary to the Z71 in the Buick lineup. We are going to see a more rugged GMC and Outside of that, some of it is really just going to come down to what kind of interior do you like. The interior in the GMC is notably more premium than this. We have a different kind of infotainment system. It's a large tablet style display rather than the very linear display in the dashboard. And then the Buick has really more of a Lexus Acura style interior. It goes back to a very linear display, but it's one enormous display across the dashboard, not separate LCDs. So GM is really going hog wild with the LCDs. If you want the most premium expression of General Motors new interior design philosophy, that's going to be in the Buick. Be sure and check out that video. I take a deep dive into the model that I was able to get hands on with in Detroit. And I have to say that blue and ivory interior is absolutely fantastic looking in that Buick. We don't know what the pricing structure is going to be, but that's probably the other thing I should mention. When I first saw this, I assumed that the Traverse was going to have a pretty significant price bump. And instead, Chevy really held the line on pricing while adding a ton of extra features and a whole lot more power. That alone really makes me so much more impressed with the Traverse than honestly I thought I was going to be. And I was already fairly impressed with its design, especially the interior, the extra features, etc. But the pricing is really, I think, where GM has done their best work on the Traverse. And that makes me think that maybe the GMC and the Buick, they're also going to hold their line on pricing. But again, a little bit further spread from one another, a little bit more differentiated from one another, one another than perhaps in the past. So let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. I would say if you're shopping for a Grand Cherokee L, the GMC is probably going to be a slightly better comparison because its interior is more premium. I do like the Grand Cherokee L's interior a bit more than this, but I actually like this interior more than the Grand Highlander. Yes, the Grand Highlander can have big screens, but they're not standard. These are definitely standard. I think this interior also comes across as a little bit more comfortable depending on the interior color. This all charcoal interior. It's not exactly my favorite. It is very monochromatic. And if you're not a favor of that, a fan of that rather, you might want to take a look at some of the other options, including again the GMC, which definitely has some more attractive interior color combos in my mind. Let me know what you think about that down there. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, X, Threads, all those sorts of things, the news, the whatevers, and I'll see all of you next week.